there's not very many people can say that uh, <laughs> that they had somebody fly, you know, from across the pond to insult them. I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. I'm just playing. My bro brother Booker, sister Booker, we we love you. And I know I speak on behalf of everybody here whenever I say that. Amen. Amen. And, and we're so thankful that, uh, that, that you've come, traveled all this way. Uh, and seriously, man, um, I love you from last year. Um, I had stopped loving you, man. I think about you guys all the time. About him, you know, I don't think about your wife. Of course, your wife's enjoying with you, right? The two should become one flesh. Amen. So there we go. Right? He doesn't take my foot out of my mouth. But... Um, you know, guys, uh, I don't know what happened to my notebook up here. Um, did somebody steal my notebook or did I steal it? I, I had a notebook here. You've got it by heart. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of do, but I just look. Jerry Sidera. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, <laughs> yeah, you got you got to have thick skin if you come here. You know, you got to have thick skin. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Amen, man. Amen. But uh, I'm, I'm so thankful to be here with you guys to close this thing out. You know, Pastor Paul asked me a couple of days ago or a few days ago, um, you know, to start a new tradition here in the church. And that would be to give the first message of the conference and give the last message of the conference. Amen. And I told you guys whenever we first started this, by the way, uh, the sermon is going to be today over the bread of life. Amen. And uh, I, I just I just want to tell you guys before I continue on here that uh, the majority of this message is inspired by two people. Right, or I should say two different, uh, one person and a group of people. Amen. So the first person that it's inspired by is uh, my brother in Christ, uh, Jared Strong, um, over here. He's an uh, absolute brilliant guy when it comes to scriptures. Okay, uh, like he, he points out things that, that I easily miss, and uh, it, it just blows my mind. So I'm very, very thankful that, that God has sent me a, uh, a faithful uh, uh, servant in the Lord. Amen. And, uh, and he is faithful to the book, to the word of God, guys. And, and I'm, I'm so very thankful to have him uh, in my local assembly. Right. Um, and the, the, the next group of people uh, that, that's inspired this is everybody that has spoken here this past few days. Right. And I told you guys, I don't know if you heard this on Thursday or not, but uh, uh, I, I told you guys that what you were going to see, what you were going to witness was everybody drinking into one spirit. Right, because we are all joined by by one spirit to one head, right? And that one head is going to give us uh, the the things that we need to speak according to our strengths, right? And all of this is done purposefully and by design to show to each and every single one of us that yes, even though we are individual members of the body of Christ, we do operate corporately, though, right? Because one person, one member of the body of Christ by himself, uh, you're not, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. That, I mean, that much is true, right? I mean, because we, we all study the Bible and we all come to different conclusions over certain subject matter. Amen. Right. But when you get us together corporately and then we are able to bounce things off one another, we can figure this thing out pretty, pretty good. Because, you know, I hear Pastor, uh, Pastor Lucas uh, saying up here all the time and he'd be like, man, we got this book lit, boys. Well, I'm up here. We know what we're doing. We know what we're saying. Amen. Right. Amen. And that's just because, you know, the, the man spends a lot of time in the word, but he also has faithful congregation that support him and also spend time in the word as well. Right. Amen. So um, I know pastors thankful for you all. I'm thankful for you all. Um, and so I kind of want to start this message. These are the scriptures that we're going to be in first Corinthians chapter 12, Psalm 89. And then we're going to go back to first Corinthians. So I kind of Try to keep it simple uh, for us. And just like Brother Mike and Kona said, is that uh, when, whenever you start putting together messages, all these things just start happening. And what happens is, is that you don't ever have enough time to present all the material that God is showing you, right? So you have to edit a lot of it out. And so like I told Brother Sherrod this morning, I said, well, uh, if I give him any more, I'm going to kill him, 
right? <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to stop where I'm at right here, and then I'm just going to make up the rest and fill it in as we go, right? So let's see what happens, right? Let's see what happens. So the first thing I want to I want to start off with is is um, is by reminding you that uh, in First Timothy chapter one it says that that there is uh, there there's sound doctrine, right? And I'm just going to write this up here. So that they teach no other doctrine, right? And then uh, I don't know if it's chapter one or not, but that's where he says that it's sound doctrine. Yes. And so this sound doctrine, what it's able to do is it's able to produce a sound mind, right? And what that's able to do, let me make sure I get this right, is, is produce sound words. Amen. And that right there is going to give us what? Sound speech. You know what the sound speech does? Gives you sound doctrine. The whole thing is cyclical. The whole thing is cyclical. You want to know why members of the body of Christ who stand up here behind this pulpit all say the same thing? Because of this process right here. Sound doctrine, producing a sound mind, which in turn enables us to, uh, to give sound words. Those sound words are formed into a sound speech, and the sound speech gives sound doctrine. It repeats itself in every single aspect of our life. Yeah. Every single aspect, right? A lot of people has talked on these things here, okay? And uh, about the individuality of the member of the body of Christ, right? Now, we know that we are supposed to uh, do things, I think I've got, you know, yeah, hold fast, form the sound words. Amen. Which is thou hast heard of men, uh, me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Another one, Titus 2, 1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, right? That's why that speech is uh, leading up to, uh, to sound doctrine here. Why? Because in doctrine, sound speech, uh, you, you need, it, it cannot be condemned, right? That cannot be condemned. And he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed. Not you being ashamed, right? Because this right here, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right? I mean, so as long as you're refuting things with this right here, with sound doctrine, you'll never be ashamed. It's the ones who are on the contrary part of this right here, of sound doctrine, that will be ashamed, right? And I Romans 3, 4, everything, guys, right? I mean, seriously, Lea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might, uh, mightest be justified in thy sayings and overcome when thou art judged. Now, that's not talking about you being overcome when you are judged. That's talking about God overcoming when he is judged. Who's going to judge God, you say? Great question. People who don't believe the gospel. Right? They are going to declare God to be unrighteous, disannul his judgments so that they can be righteous. That's what's going to happen. Right? But see... This sound speech or the sound doctrine gives us sound mind, sound words, and sound speech, right? We can understand how things in our life are supposed to work on an individual basis, okay? But corporately, corporately, what, what, what's, what's happening? Well, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, in the first half of, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he begins to lay out, um, you know, some different functionality uh, within the body of Christ. And, and uh, you know, uh, some, some things that you see is that, number one, it has offices, it has administrations, right? Uh, it, it, it has uh, uh, different operations uh, within the body, amen, that, that every single person um, is going to fill a part of, amen? Now, I don't know who's going to fill what. I'm not, I'm not going to know that. You're not going to know that. No one's going to know anything about that until the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, All right. So don't try to go into the Bible and say, "Well, I wonder what job I'm going to get in here." No, uh, don't don't do that. Right? Don't do that. The only thing that God is asking you to do is is follow, basically follow this stuff right here until you reach the center, which is what the center of it all, not the center S I N N U R. Right? But this right here, charity, what out of a pure heart. Right, out of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Right, that's the end of the commandment, guys. All of this stuff right here sound doctrine, sound mind, sound word, sound speech is to give you charity and faith unfeigned. Okay, now why is this important? 
This is what we're going to start to learn to sham. This is what we're going to start to uh, to uh, to get into, right? So uh, I got a whole bunch of verses listed here, and um, I, I may skip through some of them. I may not. Uh, well, let's go ahead and start in verse twelve. For as many, or for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit. Are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? For the body is not one member, but many. Amen? Right? So th this is individual understanding in a corporate sense. Yes, I mean, there's many, many members in the body of Christ, even though there's one individual member, right? So the foot shall say, because I am not the ham, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Simple question, yeah? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Okay? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were a hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. You know that's past tense in verse 18? He's already done it. You don't know anything about it. All right? So what does that mean for us? What does that mean? Well, let's keep reading. Hopefully we'll get a little bit of answers out of this. And if all were one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again to the head to the feet, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, and that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. See that? Right? So a governmental body is necessary to bring the creation to reconciliation to God. It's necessary. Right? How do we know it's necessary? Well, because we have uh, some crazy scriptures in our Bible, like Psalm 82. Right? You, you've already, like, but let me go ahead and say this before we even start on this. That a lot of these verses that you've already seen... Uh, it, is because of this right here, guys. Make no mistake, okay? That these verses, the reason why you keep seeing all these verses over and over and over again is not because this is all we know. It is because this is what all of this has to deal with, right? I mean, so Psalm 82, 1 to 5, a psalm of Asaph, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges, judgeth among the gods. Now, last year, I did talk about this verse, Right, but I talked about it in in another application than when I'm going to talk about it right here. Okay, but look what he says. He said, "God asks." He says, "How long will ye judge unjustly?" Right. So there's judgments that are made, and accept the persons of the wicked. But these judgments that are made, they're unjust. I mean, very clear. Right. Defend the poor, fatherless and fatherless. Do what? Justice to the afflicted. So we have judgment up here that's judged unjustly. And, and God is, is, is exhorting uh, these, these gods, the congregation of the mighty, right? I mean, and he's judging among the gods. And, and he's, he's telling them to defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted. Do justice to the afflicted because your judgments are unjust. Right? Right? So he says, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Right? And just like Brother Corn was saying just a little bit ago. I mean, this is, this is what's wrong with the world. This is what's wrong with, with everything that is in it right now. It's because of this right here. You know, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Come on, guys, you know this. That's right. So I, I love, good job, Brother Paul. I mean, I love a congregation that knows this stuff. It's so much easier to talk to than somebody who doesn't know this stuff because I'm telling you guys, if I was in any other church right now in this beautiful town of Fairmont, people would be looking at me like, what? I don't have a clue what you're saying, right? But you guys do, and this is what's so beautiful. 
I mean, th this is literally the light on the hill. Amen? All right? So, look, you know, um, here's, what is Mark? Mark 8, 29. But here's what I'm talking about. Like, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness, right? And, and behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Who is this? It's Legion, right? Everybody knows the story. Right? But, but hold on. He says, Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? So they know what their end is. That's the point that I'm trying to make to you guys, right? They know what their end is. They know that there are, there are principalities and powers. They know their spiritual wickedness, that there are rulers of the darkness of this world, and, and they're doing everything unjustly. They're judging unjustly. They're not delivering the needy and the afflicted and the poor and the fatherless, right? They're not doing any of these things. Look at Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Amen? These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Right? You know, Christ has a parable where he says that there was a publican and a Pharisee, they were praying in the temple, and the Pharisee's like, God, I thank thee that I'm not like this person, that person, I tithe this, I do that. And, I, and I'm so thankful I'm not like that publican standing over there, right? And then the publican's like, he wouldn't even so much as to look up into heaven and smote upon his breast, right? And, and, and said, what? Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Christ tells him, I tell you, rather, that that man is going to go down to his, to his house justified than the other. Hey Amen. I mean, that's, that's good stuff right there. That's deep stuff. So judgment, mercy, and faith. Uh, the, the, the leaders of Israel completely missed the mark on all that stuff right there. And how they get, how did they miss the mark on all that stuff? What was the condition of that nation whenever Christ came to it? You just saw, right, that they, you know, that behold, they cried out. These are many, many, many different spirits inside of one man, right? And their name was Legion because they are many. And look what they're doing. They're possessing. They're possessing, right? The, 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 the nation of Israel was a decrepit state whenever Christ came to them, right? And the spiritual wickedness was extremely bad within that nation, was extremely bad within that nation, so much to the point that they weren't even doing these things right here. They were definitely holding up the judgments of those that judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked. Amen, right? They weren't defending the poor, the fatherless. They weren't doing justice to the afflicted and the needy. And they definitely were not del uh, delivering them. Amen? I think we can all agree on that. All right, moving on. Luke, 40, Luke 11, 42. Now, Corin talked about this the other day. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it, when, when he said this, when you read this verse, brother, I'm going to tell you right now, man, it blew my mind. And then so much stuff started making sense to me. I was like, yes, that's what it is. Now, look, this is what Luke's account says of the exact same incident uh, um, uh, that, that is right here, right? He says that the, you have omitted the weight of your matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith, right? Look what he says here. But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Let's make a comparison. Judgment, mercy, faith. Judgment, the love of God. Look at it again. Judgment, mercy, faith. Judgment, mercy the love of God. What's mercy and faith? <laughs> See how easy it is, man. All right, it's, it's, so so uh, judgment, all right, judgment is separate than the love of God. Would you agree? But this judgment is supposed to be judged justly according to what? The love of God. Amen. All right. I mean, now th this is huge. Absolutely huge. Let's read a little bit more about this. Look at Psalm 89. <laughs> Now, we keep going. These are, these are so familiar books. If you've been watching and follow along with Pastor Paul and Corn and Brother Eric as they get up here and, you know, de deliver these messages and stuff like that, you're, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about here. And this stuff is examined quite a bit. And the reason why it's examined quite a bit is because you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You wrestle against this. That's what you're doing. 
right? And so you need to understand that this is what you're doing and this is what you're in the middle of. Now, we keep saying up here, you know, be edified, be edified, be edified, amen, and you should. But be edified in what? <laughs> the love of God, right? Because that's what's lacking up there is the love of God. Now, one thing you're going to read here is that God has done something to the heavenly places, right? Where, we, where, where, he, uh, where he sits, he inhabits eternity, amen. We all know this. And we know that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool, right? But look at verse 1. Verse 1 of Psalm 89 says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish. Where at? In the very heavens, right? So here we have, in addition to this, in the very heavens, what two things are going to be established? Right? It's faithfulness and what? That's right. In the heavens, faith and mercy is what God has established. That, that is what God has declared to rule the heavens. Right? You, you know what Job says about the heavens? In Job 15, 15, so you can fact check me. Right? You know what Job says about this? He says, yea, he putteth no trust in his saints, the heavens are not clean in his sight because it lacks this, right? It lacks this. And now this is what every single one of us are being edified to. This is the end, right? Faith and mercy, charity and faith. There it is. This is the end of the commandment. Every single one of us as a member of the body of Christ is being edified to this end right here so you can bring faith and mercy to the heavens, right? Let's keep reading. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. I think that's you, by the way. And for who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Amen. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is perfect. What else? I mean, I mean, all different kinds of things you can say about the fear of the Lord. All you got to do is just look the phrase up in your Bible, and it'll give you 10 or 12 different references concerning the fear of the Lord and exactly what it is, right? But do you know who really fears the Lord? Do you think the lost are out there fearing the war? I, I guarantee you, if your neighbors across the street over here and back here, they don't fear the Lord. You want to know why I know that? Because they're not in here. I mean, seriously, that, that's how I know they don't fear the Lord. Right? But they, they, you know, the only people to fear the Lord is who? The assembly of the saints. That's why, this is why I think this is the body of Christ. There's other reasons why I think it's the body of Christ I don't have time to get into right now. But nonetheless, right? God is greatly feared in the assembly of the saints. Right? And to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. So God is going to get rid of, of all of these things in the heavenly places that do not do justice to the afflicted and the needy and the poor, right? All of these things and the fatherless man, none of them, right? I mean, so God's going to get rid of all of it. And what is he going to replace it with? Now, two things we know that God isn't doing today. Two things we know for sure that God isn't doing today. Number one, he's not making more angels. And they don't reproduce with each other because they're all male. Can angels reproduce? Absolutely. Read Genesis 6. But they don't reproduce with each other. Why not? Because they're all male. Okay? Now, with that being said, let's just uh, let's look, at, look at verse uh, 14. Look at verse 14. He says, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. You see that? Now, all these principalities and powers that are judging unjustly, boom, there it is. A change, the point is, the change has to occur in order for judgment to become just, in order for mercy to be shown, right? A change has to occur. Now, this is the whole point of you being edified individually as a member of the body of Christ so you can operate corporately bringing these two things to the heavenly places, faith and mercy. Amen. We all believe Jesus Christ. How many people walk perfectly? Let me ask you that. I don't see a hand raised. 
You know what? If I ask that other question in the other churches, not in just area, but I'm talking about like in similar minded churches, you know, nobody else would raise their hand either. I don't mean that. You know, the apostle Paul wouldn't even raise his hand. He's the chiefest. That's right. He's the chiefest of sinners. He'll tell you point blank. He's not meant to be an apostle. Why? Because he persecuted the church of God. Right? But by the grace of God, he is what he is. That's the same thing with every single one of us. Right? So you better get on board with what it is God's trying to do today concerning the heavenly places. Right? He's not worried about our life here on this earth. Guess what? That life is forfeit. You're dead with Christ. Your old man's crucified with him. Amen. So now you're going to be buried, and now you've got to resurrect the newness of life. Is Christ doing something new? Yeah, guess what you need to do? Something new. That's right. If that's what you said, you're 100% right. Right? So what does Romans 5.5 5 say? Romans 5.5 5 says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because why? The love of God is done what? Shed abroad. Where at? In our hearts, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. There's the beginning of it right there. This is the first time in Paul's epistles the love of God is ever used. And he's using it to show you that the love of God has been given to you and shed abroad in your hearts. Why don't you turn around and show that to the rest of the world? You know, most people take the love of God and they just keep it in their heart and don't even let it shine. They don't. They just keep it in their heart, man. They just sit there and, and, and just keep it in, keep it in, keep it in. Love for me, but not for thee. Right? I mean, and that, that's, that's pretty bad. You know, this right here is supposed to work effectually in you. How's it working effectually in you if you're going down the highway and you're singing your contemporary Jesus music and next thing you know, a guy cuts you off? What are you going to do? I mean, some people get mad, start riding on that bumper, honking that horn, flashing those brights, right? Some people might say a few choice words, scream at the top of their lungs, you know, maybe do something else that they're not supposed to be doing. Amen. The, the thing is, is that, you know, this is what I was talking about on Thursday is that when motion starts to take over, doctrine goes right out the window. It seriously does. Now, when incidents like that occur, what are we supposed to do? The first thing that we are supposed to do is, what does God say? Romans 3, 4, everything. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Right? Romans 3, 4. Does God say how I should act in this? Does God give me liberty to take vengeance upon that person? No. <laughs> he sure doesn't, but do we? Yeah, most definitely. Right? I know members of the body of Christ that go to civil court. I mean, we're not supposed to do that, right? We're not supposed to go to civil court. We're not supposed, right? We're supposed to judge things within the body, right? Because that judgment has been delivered to the body, right? We're wise in those aspects, right? Way wiser than any other magistrate of the world concerning spiritual things, amen? And so this right here is supposed to work inside of every single one of us individually so that when we come together in this very kind of setting, this is the type of stuff that perpetuates and this is why you hear nothing but about these two things this entire conference. This is what it's going to be like in eternity, by the way, guys. I mean, it seriously is. I mean, we're, we're all going to come together. We're going to fellowship. We're going to get things accomplished for, for Jesus Christ and for the Lord God, right? Going out into the world, declaring his righteousness for all. Amen. Yeah, there's going to be a part in, 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 uh, in, in eternity future, right, where where. You know, we're not going to have to worry about uh, people reviling and reproaching, you know, and things of that nature. We go out of the world, preach the, uh, the, the glory of God and Jesus Christ, man, and everybody's going to say amen. Yeah. Right? Can't wait. <laughs> amen. Right? But, uh, you know, I'm telling you guys, man, that there is a lot of stuff that we are supposed to be practicing on this earth right now because it is profitable for not only the life that now is, but for that which is to come. That's what it is. So when the Bible tells you, be not bitter against your wives, you're going to say, not today, Lord. Today she deserves it. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, Eric, he gets, he gets a little fun, uh, uh, spun up about Rachel doing her Racheling while she's driving. Now, that's, that's so funny. I love watching them too. They are, I mean, I'm serious, man. Those guys right here, and there's other couples here. I'm not trying to you know, segregate or anything, but I love watching them too. Because they got a beautiful family and 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 they just they're just awesome, 
right? But Katie and Ben, love you guys. Corn, Carly, love you guys. Jacob and Suzanne back there in the back, love you guys. If I miss anybody here, I'm so sorry, but uh, I'm, I'm not meaning to. But man, you guys are just, you're just awesome, and I absolutely love you. And there's doctrine that is given to, to, to husbands and wives and to children so that they can practice those things within a familial sense, right? And, and you glean things from that, right? So you can take it and apply it out here, right? Faith, uh, faith and mercy in the heavenly places. And you can understand how to bring about charity and faith in others. Because let me tell you guys, you think you're the only ones that's going to have to rightly divide the word of truth. You're, you're severely wrong. You know who else is going to have to rightly divide the word of truth? The people who get left behind. They're going to have to rightly divide the word of truth and figure out what's going on. Now, the chances of them figuring out what's going on and then something good coming of it, nah, that's not very good. It's not a very good chance at all. And especially if you believe what God says about, you know, the day of the Lord and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Ezekiel, you know, all those major places and minor places, right? But nonetheless, my point is, is that there are things that we are supposed to be practicing just in our individual sense that we are going to come corporately together on in order to accomplish faith and, faith and mercy in the heavens. That's my point, right? That's why it's so important that every single person takes a hold of this and says, you know what? Maybe I should start trying to do my part. Amen. And you don't have to go out on the street corner and hold up a sign and preach. You know, God told me, taught me that over the past, you know, three, four days because I can't go out and, and I can, I can go out. Amen. And I can hold up a sign. I can pass out gospel tracts. I can do all kinds of different things in a support role. But when it comes to taking that microphone, I'm like, <laughs> nothing comes out. And that's because it's just, it, 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 it just, it, it leaves me. But I tell you what, my little 13 year old boy, my big 13 year old boy, he, he could take that microphone and just let him have it. And I, it blew me away. This is the first time I ever heard him preach. I never heard the boy preach before. I was giving gospel tracts, timelines, you know, things like that. I'm like, take him to school with you, pass him out at school. And he does. He'll go in there and preach in the cafeteria. He'll preach on the playground. He preaches in the gymnasium. He preaches in his classroom. One time I got a phone call from the teacher who said, hey, you know, uh, I got your boy sitting here, uh, or stand, not sitting here, standing on his desk preaching to the class. And I'm like, hey, hey amen, but uh, I'll talk to him. Um, you know, getting, when I said amen, the teacher was kind of like, what, what, no, it's not a good thing, Mr. Morgan. And I'm like, I don't, I just, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. And I said, boy, you understand there's a time and a place for it, right? I, praise God that you got a zeal for the Lord. I'm, I'm very, very excited for that. But the teacher's time is the teacher's time, and we have to respect that, right? Because God is a, a God of order. Amen. He is a God of order. And, and so much so that when, when Satan and Moses disputed about the body of Moses, Right now, not Satan, Moses, excuse me, but Satan and, and Michael disputed about the body of Moses. You know, it, it says that Michael durst not bring a railing accusation against Satan, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Amen. Well, even Michael, the archangel, the prince of Israel, understands that there, there, there is a time for things and there's a place for things. Amen. So that's just very important that we teach our young that. Do they have a zeal for it? Absolutely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go home, max out a credit card, and I'm going to get this boy everything he needs, and I'm going to take him out street preaching. I'm just going to give him the microphone and hold the sign. <laughs> All right, listen to him. Don't listen. You come to church, I'll teach you. I got no problem with that. See, I can stand up behind here and talk to you guys all day long. All day long. But you get me out there on that street corner and it don't happen. I just don't. I'll hold a sign. <laughs> that's all I can do, right? Amen. So, all right, let's continue on. Romans 5, 5. We understand that there's love of Christ. Amen. Uh, in, in uh, well, Romans 5, 5 is that the love of God, excuse me, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Amen. Well, what about the love of Christ? Well, do you know that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in? There you go, right? So is love of God and the love of Christ one and the same? I think so, but I think the love of Christ actually adds a little bit more dimension to it. Amen. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that's shed abroad in our hearts, and this is what this is what God is beseeching us by. In Romans chapter 12, I beseech you by the mercies of God. Amen. Well, one of the mercies of God is the love of God that's been shed abroad in your hearts, right? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Amen. Being rooted and grounded in love. Amen. <laughs> 
may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and depth and the height. Now, look, I, I'm, we all understand that these, you know, these terms, breadth, length, depth, height, you know how many times I've heard people try to explain that stuff? But this is what I want to point out. And to know the love of Christ, which what? Yes. Passeth knowledge. Now, Pastor Paul hit on this a couple of days ago. If not yesterday, I can't remember, right? But nonetheless, he hit on this, okay? And, and he pointed out exactly what it is that, that I'm pointing out to you here is that God wants you to know something that knowledge can't teach you. How does that happen? How do you come to know something that knowledge cannot teach you? Experience. How do you get experience? Exercise. You know, my dad's been in the oil industry, I don't know how many years, I mean, 40 plus years in the oil industry. And I'll never forget this one time, he had a whole bunch of engineers with him making six figures a year. These big, hot, you know, hot shot engineers that come out of college, you know, 28, 29, 30 years old. And, and they think they just know the world, okay? You know, they've oh, accomplished this in my life. And you take them out into the field and, and my dad had a problem. They went out to a valve box and this valve box had three valves that control the pipeline. And they looked at that, scratching their heads going, which valve is it? My dad, 40 plus years in the oil field, goes out there and looks at it and goes, it's that one right there, turn it off. And they did, they reached down and when it worked, you know, the, the leak stopped and everything, they looked at my dad, they said, how in the world did you know that? 40 years experience in the oil field, that's how I knew that. I mean, so experience teaches us. Experience is the greatest teacher that you could possibly do. I played a violin, right? And I'm going to tell you guys, I, I played it for 30 something years now. And I wouldn't be able to play that if I did not have the experience to do it. Because you get it in the hands of Pastor Paul, and he's like, I don't know what I'm doing, brother. Come teach me something. Amen. Man, I will. I'll come teach you something. But at the same time, we're very similar in age. This is the point that I'm making. We're very similar in age, Pastor Paul and I. Right? However, however, I can pick that instrument up and he can't. Why not? That's right, because of experience. I spent more time with that instrument than, than I have with the Word of God, sad to say. Amen? But he spent more time with the Word of God than he has with that instrument. So you know what he can do better than I can? Right? He can expound to you the Word of God more clearly and in tune than I can. Right? Do you see how that works both ways? Well, see, your Heavenly Father is wanting the exact same individuals for his eternal purpose. He wants the people that is going to bring faith and mercy, and they're going to know how to do it, right? I've heard, who was it said one time, man, that, you know, if, would you, if you ever have somebody uh, or if you ever have a, a problem that needs a plumber or an electrician, who are you going to call? Are you going to call a plumber? You better not say, who said Ghostbusters? I heard that. I never <laughs> Hey, we're not, we're not called the Ghostbusters. You don't call the Ghostbusters for a plumbing problem. Hey, man, you don't, you don't call them for an electrician problem either. You call what's required, hey, amen? And those individuals, why do we call them? Because they have experience. It's, it's the exact same operation here. It's the exact same operation here. And so the things, the thrones, dimensions, dominions, principalities, and powers, all these things that exist in the heavenly places that were created by, uh, by Christ Jesus, by him and for him, amen, it's the same. It's the same principles here. It's the exact same principles here. So the only thing that's different is that the head was well, not different, you know, here and there. But what I'm saying is, is that what doesn't operate in those, in, in the heavens is faith and mercy. It doesn't operate at all. Yeah, the, the devils believe and tremble. Okay, bless God. But do they have faith? No. <laughs> no, if they did, they'd believe God. Amen? And I think that's what Satan's problem was, right? Is that he was a liar from the beginning. Why? Because he abode not in the truth. Amen? The truth of God said this, and Satan said, you know what? Nope, I don't believe that. I'm going to do my own thing. Okay, iniquity. Amen? All right? And so now we've been fighting this for millennia. Who knows how long this has been going on? Because if you believe the gap fact, then this has been going on for an undetermined period of time. And so you're in the middle of an angelic conflict that's been happening for millennia, right? And we're worried about our 45, 50 years of existence on this world, how we can be more comfortable. That's, that's really, really sad. You know, people, wide is the road to hell. That's right. All right, but narrow is the way. Straight is the gate. Right? 
So we need to make, uh, you know, yesterday when we were, not yesterday, it was uh, Friday. We were out there. Sebastian was uh, preaching on Brother Enoch's mic, walking up and down the road. And uh, he was preaching something. And I saw this old man, disgruntled look on his face. You know, he drives by, he creeps up real slow on me. And I'm sitting there holding the sign, you know, it said, uh, a fool said in his heart, there is no God. Hey, Amen. I like that sign. I'm going to buy one for myself. Right. And I'm holding this sign up and he rolls up on me. He's got this real sturdy look. He goes, there's more than one way to get to God. And then he just drives off. And I'm like, man, that's a very Catholic response. I, that is a very, very, very Catholic response, man. And, and because they do, they believe there's one way to get to God, more than one way to get to God. And it's just so sad because people are operating with that type of wisdom in this world. Why? Because they know not the mind of Christ. They just don't. They don't know Christ in general. I had one lady tell me one time, she said, I don't know the Bible. I don't know the Bible, but I know Jesus. <laughs> on what world does that make sense? Not on the, it doesn't make sense to me on this world. Right? You may know you may know Jesus, but you don't know the Bible. How can you know Jesus without knowing the Bible? Christ is the Word. The Word is Christ. No, I mean, amen. Christ is the Word made flesh. It's scary what people think, man. It's extremely scary what people think. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians verse 3 and 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Amen. Now, you know, if you know anything about these, these Thessalonian churches, right, the, the, the church at, at Thessalonica uh, was applauded because of their love and their faith toward their brethren, right? They, uh, they, they loved one another, uh, and they were exhorted to increase the more and the more, right? This is something that, this is the love of God is something that knows no bounds, right? Um, when we were in the Philippines, uh, Pastor Paul introduced me to a hymn called The Love of God. I don't know if you ever have heard that hymn or not, but um, he, he told me the, uh, the, the last line uh, to that. And it, it goes, if we with ink uh, the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made and every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. I, when he told that to me, I sat there and just looked at it. He probably thought like he had hit my reset button or something because I just stared at him like, that's, I, that, that's beautiful. That's, I, I've never heard that before, right? And I, I did a little research on it because I wanted to memorize that. And I uh, did a little research on it uh, to see where, the, where did that hymn come from? I'm really big on lyrics. I don't know if you know that about me or not. You probably don't. But uh, I'm really big on lyrics, okay? I don't just listen to anything. I mean, you know, if it has a message to it, I'll listen, okay? But if it's just, oh, baby, I miss you, 14 years old at home with a broken heart, that's I'm turning it off, okay? Because I know that's just a bunch of garbage, okay? But I was looking at this, the love of God, man. Did you know that that last verse they say they found written in a jail cell? Yeah, a saint asylum. That's what it was. It was in a saint asylum. That's what it was. Yeah, it was some some padded room and in the saint asylum. That's not real. That's probably the most beautiful line in a hymn I have ever heard in my life. And they found it in the saint asylum. So the love of God, the height, the breadth, the length, right, the depth. I, I mean, you never know when you're going to find the love of God in the saint asylum, the lowest hell. Doesn't David write that it doesn't matter if I'm up here, way above, you're there. If I'm in the lowest hell, you're there. Doesn't matter where I'm at, Lord, you're there. Amen. 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 Right? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, we're going to go ahead and try to uh, uh, speed this up a little bit because I don't want to keep you guys too much longer but because I'm having so much fun with you. Uh, but if you look at just 1 Corinthians, just, just bear with me here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then we'll go to chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I, I got all these verses, you know, lined up that I wanted to read. I want to read all from starting verse 35, and I want to read all the way down to verse 39, um, or 49, excuse me, but I don't think I'm going to make it that far. Um, I, I just, I, I, I maybe just touch on a few things uh, in, in this uh, big passage of scripture here. Um, because uh, this is, it's just really, really important. Now, I did speak on this a little bit last year, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on it a little bit more again. Now, the title of this message was The Bread of Life. Amen. And, and one thing that, that I want to uh, uh, 
Um, I don't know if I really want to do this shit. Okay, all right, we'll go ahead and do it. So Brother Gary, he, he wrote a book. Right. Amen. Love, love the book. Uh, I've got it in my big truck. I drive a commercial truck, man. And I, you know, in case I'm waiting somewhere to at the mill, whatever mill I'm at, I got a book in the back. I just take out and start reading if I'm ever getting bored. Right. So uh, he wrote a book. I'm about halfway through this book, man. It's an absolute beautiful book. Very well written. Very well stated. Very well thought out. Amen. But but he's got at, at the front of his book. This is so awesome. And I thought he was going to do this, but he didn't. So let me do it. <laughs> anyway, uh, Deuteronomy, at the front of this book, he's got a little post-it note on it, right? And he has three scriptures on it. And this is, these are the three scriptures that he has on the front of this book. The first one is Deuteronomy 8.3, right? So we're just going to, what does Deuteronomy 8.3 say? I'm just going to write the numbers because I don't, I don't, you know, the Deuteronomy is where it comes from. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. I think Brother Gary did quote this, as a matter of fact. And fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only or onely, amen, as the 1611 says, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live, amen. Well, it's in your Bible two more times in two more different places, right, or two more places that Jesus Christ says, Matthew 4, 4, so we're going to write that scripture as well, and Luke 4, 4, right? Now, I'm not going to read both for the sake of time. But they say pretty much, uh, they're, they're both quotations of Deuteronomy 8.3, that's man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. That's pretty awesome. Now, on that post-it, on the front of his book, this is so beautiful. I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but if you were to add these scriptures together, let me show you what you get. If you take the chapter numbers, 8 plus 4 plus 4 equals what? <laughs> oh, man. What does the 3 plus 4 plus 4 equal? Bam, there it is, man. So the 1611, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Do you know that's every member of the body of Christ? You don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. As a matter of fact, you are so at one with Jesus Christ, you know he calls you flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. Right? You know you're supposed to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Right? So there are some things, I mean, and richly, if you were to actually examine that word, that's kind of like a baking term, just about, wouldn't you say, right? I mean, the, when you uh, get like a real good piece of chocolate cake, man, I love chocolate, bet you can't tell, uh, but <laughs> I love chocolate, man, and you get a real good piece of chocolate cake, and you just need that real tall glass of milk, man, oh, dude, that's a rich cake, amen, right? <laughs> Well, you know, like Brother Jared pointed out uh, a few Sundays ago, whenever he brought this message in, in my congregation, um, you know, he said there are different types of grain that exist in the world. People make bread out of different things. You know, uh, a lighter grain, such as wheat, is digestible even by the, uh, the, uh, uh, the youngest of stomachs, right? So if you were to provide, uh, you know, uh, white bread, enriched white bread to, uh, you know, to a child, they would be able to digest it and digest it without any kind of hunger pain whatsoever, right? But you start getting into pumpernickel. That's a thicker bread, right? Ciabatta is a different bread. There's all different kinds of different breads in the world that are made from different grains. And each one is, can be digested by different people in a different age. Amen. The word of God is the exact same way within, within each and every single one of us, right? The, the lighter of the grains is wheat, okay? But the more complicated grains, those are the ones that actually um, uh, take a little bit more time in the word of God to develop within each and every single one of us to the point where we can actually digest it and digest it without any kind of problems, Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I've read this book before and it's made me so mad. I've taken it and thrown it across my living room. Don't think for an instant I'm lying to you. I have. My son's witnessed it. Like, oh, like when's the last time the word of God has ever affected us negatively? Do you ever let it affect you negatively? That's the next follow up question. Right. I mean, you'd have to let this book deal with you. That's why I said in the very beginning that this book, it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And you cannot bring this book up in your mind, what does the word of God say about it, if this book ain't in you discerning those thoughts and intents of the heart. It's just, it's just not going to happen, right? So when the book tells you to behave a certain way, 
It's not a suggestion that you do it every now and then or whenever you wake up feeling like it. It's, a, it's literally a commandment telling you this is how you were to think. This is how you were supposed to behave. And this is how you were supposed to speak from here on out. Now, if Brother Bill was here. I was going to say, you know, three years ago, I said, Brother Bill, you got a new identity, right? No, it's the same thing. I was going to tell him again, brother, you had a new identity. You were given something brand spanking new. Are you still acting the same? Most people are. The only thing they want is that free gift. Leave me alone. You know, let me profess the name of Christ. Now leave me alone. Right? They don't care anything about going into the world, making a difference, let alone getting in this book and making a difference in their life. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. But nonetheless, it's so true. It's so, so, so true. So now that I've gotten this up here on the board and, and out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the meat of it, man. So I done turned my book. I didn't mean to. I'm so sorry, guys. I mean, I did. I was trying to <laughs> make a point. But look at verse 30, uh, uh, 35. 35 says, but some man will say, how art the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, except that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body which shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. Do you see the connection that I'm making here, right? Your understanding of the word of God is what's going to determine what grain you produce when your body is resurrected, yeah. yep. right? And the measure of the inheritance of Christ is going to be given to you based upon what is produced. That's what it is, right? But there's more of a purpose to that. Right. Yes, you are going to be produced something, right? And, and, and uh, look at verse 38. It says, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. That's past tense. God already knows. You don't. So God says, continue in faith, mercy, and charity. Amen? That's the end of the commandment. No, God, not until you tell me what I'm going to be doing. That's where most people are. They don't want to continue in this just because God says so. They want to understand why God's telling them to continue to this before. But see, God's not giving you that reason. He's just telling you, hey, look, there's a problem with the heavenly places. This stuff isn't raining there, but it needs to. But you can practice this now on earth because it's profitable for now, which can do all of these things right, that I caught up here and not even anymore, I'm pointing to it like it's still there. But nonetheless, you can do all of these things for all these different reasons, right? And not only can you do it now to counteract what's going on there, but when the time comes, you're also going to be able to take what you learned here and practice it up there. And that's what your heavenly father's looking for, right? That's what he's looking for. So there is a, a, a an explanation here of the resurrected body from 39 to 43. Uh, he says that all flesh is not the same flesh. There's a flesh of men, flesh of beasts, another of fishes and another of birds, right? Birds don't live in the air or birds don't live in the water and fishes don't live in the air, meaning that, you know, the resurrected body has to have or, or it has to be conducive to the environment in which it exists. Uh, verse 40, there's celestial bodies, bodies terrestrial. The glory of celestial is one, glory of terrestrial is another, the, uh, the one glory of the sun, one, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. Why? For one star differeth from another star in glory. Look what he says in verse, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Every single one of us is going to look different in the resurrection. We're all going to look different. And the reason why is because we've all been edified for different things. Right? We've, we've, I'm not saying that God, you know, said, okay, I, that's enough work over here. I'm going to go concentrate on this person now. No, it has to do with us. God is going to work on us as long as we are, you know, uh, complicit in that, in that labor. Amen. There's a minute that you stop, God stops you. I know a lot of people that sleep with this book and they are none the wiser because they do that. They're just not right. So let's go ahead and wrap it up here. Right. Uh, John 6, verses 31 to 35. My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Christ is talking about himself, amen? 
He says, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven. That would be Jesus Christ, amen? And giveth life unto the world. And then he says down here in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Christ is the bread of life. You believe that, right? Amen, you believe that? Matthew 26, 26. Right? Or Matthew, this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. That's so weird. Apparently, I forgot to write that verse down. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry, guys. So, um, Matthew, so, this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 13. Now, look, I, may, I think I should have put this slide at the end, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think I should have. It should have gone right here. Um, but look what he says here. This is Christ teaching the Jews how to pray in the wilderness. He says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, if I knows this, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day what? What? Our daily bread, right? Give us this day our daily bread. What does all this have to do, right? Look at Mark 26 or Matthew 26, 26. He says, in this they were eating. Jesus took bread and blessed uh, and, and break it and gave it to the other disciples and said, take, eat what? This is my body. What are you called? The body of Christ, right? Hmm. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, take, eat. This is my body. Once again, he tells them in Luke 16, 19, he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Amen. You know, you have an ordinance that the apostle Paul leaves uh, concerning the, the death of the Lord Jesus that you're supposed to take communion, right? Showing the death of the Lord Jesus until he comes. You know, that's a spiritual attack against Satan whenever you do that kind of stuff. Right, that's why he's telling you that. And you ever want to have something come against your church big time? Take the Lord's, take the Lord's table, take it. See what happens. See who all shows up to try to mess everything you're doing up. Because what you did is you just took the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and slapped Satan in the face with it. That's what you did. All right. So once again, where does all this lead up to? Psalm forty and verse six. Psalm 40 and verse 6, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. My ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. That, that's what the original says. But then the apostle Paul quotes this in the book of Hebrews. And he says, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not. But a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Amen. Amen. All right, so what's different between these two? See, here, here the psalmist says that, you know, Christ's ears were open. Now, this is all about Jesus Christ. You would agree, yes? Right, so Christ's ears were open, but what is it that he was told? A body was prepared for him. Amen. Right? Bread of life, guys. He's the bread of life. Wouldn't you agree? His body was break for you. Amen? So what does this mean for us? Do you know that Israel is going to have a, a period of suffering as they're persecuted into extinction, right? Are they, are they going to be extinct? No, not at all. God's already preserved to himself an election according to grace and according to the 144,000, they're sealed, amen? But nonetheless, that's still time of persecution and that time of purging is coming upon Jerusalem. It's coming, right? And, and they're going to they're, they're, they're gonna flee into the wilderness, and they're going to say, give us this day our daily bread, right? And there are, there are things that they are going to suffer. But you being a member of the body of Christ, you've been taken out of here. Revelation 12 has already happened, right? Satan's kicked out down to the earth, and it says, yeah, you know, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, right? For the accuser of our brethren has been cast out, but woe unto you and the inhabitants of the earth. Why? Because the devil walketh around as a roaring lion seeking to whom he may devour. Right? A lot of suffering is going to be going on. You know, they're going to go to God in prayer. They're going to be like, Lord, ease us to suffering, right? Take no thought for what you're going to eat. Take no thought for what you're going to wear, right? You see the abomination, abomination of desolation set up in, in, the, uh, in the holy places spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Flee into the mountains, right? Isn't that what's written? Amen. Well, there's going to be a lot of suffering going on because of that. Who do you think is going to minister to Israel in their suffering? All right? Amen, brother. That's right. The body of Christ. Look at chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Now, Jared and I were in our room last night 
And, and I was like, man, I'm going to need your help with this. I need a pair of extra pair of eyes looking at something. And we came across this right here. Now, this has been staring us in the face the whole time, but I don't think anybody's ever seen it. If you have, I apologize. But if you haven't, I think this is going to open up a lot of eyes for us. Okay, so what I'm telling you what the purpose of the body of Christ is, right? So if you look at verse, uh, I got 16 wrote down, 16 to 18. So Brother Eric talked about this verse right here. He says, the cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread. That's what it says. I didn't make that up. Yours, yours doesn't say that, right? Let's just all get on the same page and talk about that for a second. Right? I mean, that all says one bread. Amen. Everybody's, yes, David, yes, that's right. Right? So, yeah, that's, that's one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Now look what he says in verse 18. Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? You see what that's saying about you? Yeah. Right? You want to know about the suffering of Israel? You want to know that what your eternal purpose is designed to do is to relieve that suffering? That's what it is. Now, that, that's just, you know, not want to say your eternal purpose, you know, is forever and ever and ever. It's not what I'm saying. But when you go into creation, right, even with, even with the nation of Israel as it's operating on the earth for the glory of God, right, you're going to be ministering to, to, to Israel what it is that you need to minister to the nation of Israel, whatever God has planned, right? But you need to operate and minister within these two, these two things right here, charity and faith. Faith and mercy. Amen? Anybody, anybody have any uh, questions, arguments, complaints? Anything you want to tell me to study a little bit more? All right? Because I think, I, I think we pretty much got this thing licked, guys. All right? The theme of the conference is this. The theme of the conference is this. Christ in you and how Christ in you is edified, right? Amen? And this is the reason why. Amen. And, and guys, this is going to be an absolute glorious thing. Uh, let, let's go ahead and get Pastor up here, and he can go ahead and uh, dismiss us and uh, everything else. Brother, I do appreciate you. Thank you so much for having us. Amen.